Hey guys, Connor here from CameraStore.com and I'm joined again by Nico from Camera Rescue. We're going through another top 10 of 2022. Uh, this is using search data from 2021 to predict what will be the most popular cameras in the coming year. So today we're doing medium format. So the big boys in front of us. Um, so why not just let's get started. Yeah, let's start. Yeah, so the top of the list we have the Mamiya 645, and this is really a family of cameras. It's not just one specific model. So there are older uh, full metal, uh, all manual ones, and then there's, there's lower end models, and then there's more plasticky later ones. Um, basically all called Mamiya 645, and that's probably part of why they're at the top of the list. Um, Excellent cameras. The, the newer ones have interchangeable backs, but the older ones don't. Um, yeah, and that 645 format gives you a, a bigger increase to image quality than you might think. Um, there's a lot of people that, that say that it's not really that much of an increase over 35, but I disagree. Yeah, I mean, the negative is three times bigger than 35 in like real estate. And then, like you said, it's a family of products like 645. Basically, anyone looking for Mamiya 645 knows there's like the M, the Super, the 645 1000S, there's the 645 AF, AFD. There's some with AF lenses, which, you know, is convenient. And yeah, I think that's the surprise here is that it's number one, even though nobody would expect that to be number one, probably because when we do the data, we don't account for each exact model. Sometimes we have to group them a little bit because whoever's searching might not know there's 10 different uh, 645 models. So it does add up to the searches. But yeah, it's a great camera. Film prices going up. Uh, film economy is a thing. Shoots around 15 to 16 shots per roll of 120 film. Uh, glass is really nice. It's pretty compact considering. And it has all the bells and whistles that you might need if you're wanting to shoot professional uh, or similar to professional style photography and not break the bank like a contact 645 or anything like that So yeah, I'm just, it's a surprise that it's number one, but not because it's such a big family basically Yeah, and, and like you said, there's the autofocus mount as well, which is it's technically a different mount But still made today They, they still are making them uh, Mamiya in partnership with phase one are making digital only versions of this camera today, so you can buy new lenses that they won't work on the manual focus bodies, but... Yeah. But they'll work on the latest AFD, basically. Yeah. But still but yeah. called Mamiya 645. Yeah. yeah, it's a great camera, honestly. And surprised that it's number one, but you know, still not bad. And yes. then we have uh, the big boy. Yes, the certified big boy. The second camera on our list is the Mamiya RB67. Uh, a fully mechanical six by seven a uh, rotating back, that's what RB stands for, rotating back 120 SLR, um, leaf shutter lenses, bellows focusing, so you get maybe better close focus ability than a lot of other modular uh, SLRs. Um, just a <laughs> massive camera really meant for studio use, but it has become super popular with influencers and, and young people that, that want a somewhat approachable price point for the 6x7 negative so yeah i think for many many years the mamiya rb and rz together were quite undervalued because of their size uh mamiya 7s pentax 6x7s were a little bit more friendly on the size and these like you said are more studio based cameras so you have to like flip the back and usually were meant for a tripod or handheld with a grip and a prism and they get to like four kilos with all the add-ons but nowadays people have realized they were sold for very little money. Still, you can find some pretty affordably if you look around, but they might require a CLA, so be careful with that. But yeah, like the Bellows, super flexible camera. I think the RB and RZ are probably the most flexible cameras in the medium format, if you don't count on the Fuji GX680, which is yeah. more flexible except for the weight. Yeah. Uh, it's like a dinosaur <laughs> size. But yeah, these cameras are amazing. They have the Mamiya on them that nowadays is a sign of, you know, uh, hype online from videos to Instagram, so so on. So it is no surprise. Plus, you know, fully mechanical, who what's not to like. You can service them, the leaf shutter, so they sync at all speeds with flash. They, yeah, they're just really, really good cameras. And I think they're probably on top of the RZ 
due to the fact that they are most commonly cheaper than the RZ, even though they are mechanical and will be repaired in you know, probably decades to come as the RZ has, you know, some electronics and if it fails, then you might have, you know, to do a major investment on repairs because they're harder to source, there's less of them. But yeah, I think it's a very well deserved and I'm happy to see it on top of the RZ. Yeah. Do you, do you know if the RB and RZ were sold concurrently? Yeah, 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 yeah. The RB was sold for many, many years, like from the 70s, uh, we have the dates here and the RZ came out in 82. This was sold uh, for many years. You had the RZ, uh, Pro, Pro S, and then the Pro SD. The SD brought the backs without light baffles, uh, so you could basically you not know, have so many issues. They also had the 6x8 back, which was motorized, the Polaroid back that actually is 7x7, so you could shoot like the peel apart film for studio proofs mostly. Uh, so yeah, it was a really good camera, but both were sold at the same time. I guess some people wanted the mechanical part and some people like the uh, RZ. Um, arguably the RZ, when they were both sold, were probably better for the features that it had for the electronics and so on, and the light meters and all that, but the RB throughout the years will probably, you know, king the RZ due to mechanics. Yeah. I couldn't have said it better. Just one second. Nice. Number three, we have the while Connor finds the dark side. Sorry. It's not hard, but sometimes it's confusing. No, I don't think you have to talk. Oh, there it is. No, sorry. I just put it in the wrong slot. <laughs> so yeah, we have number three, the Mamiya RZ. So this is the, the follow-up the, the, you know, a, a second version of a 6x7 SLR made by Mamiya, uh, released in 1982, so 12 years after the release of the RB that we just talked about. Um, this added electronics, it's, it's made with a lot more plastic, but it's still quite a sturdy, robust camera. Yeah. Um, it has basically all of the advantages of the RB system, so rotating backs, um, the bellows focusing, and this actually has, the, has a two ring system, no, the, R, the RZ67 Pro 2 has the two ring system. I was looking for the second ring. One was the quick focus and one was the fine focus. So it, only on the, on the last model you have that. Yeah. So that, that's a big advantage if you do get that, is that you have these, the dial here that's coarse focusing, rough focusing, and then you have a second dial that's a lot more precise. Yeah. And when you're working, you know, ultra macro, doing portraiture, and you have to get that eye in focus, that, that precision focusing is really, really helpful. Because yeah. especially if you're using a waist level finder or you know something where you're not right in it to yeah. see. But yeah, I think the RZ like did what the RB started, but just a little bit better. And like I said, in the time, it was probably like a big advantage to have a lot of the bells and whistles from the electronics in there. Like it could like meter, you could have the prism and so on. So it was really, really nice. It is still a very loved camera. I would say that nowadays, if people could afford one of them too, they probably would buy the RZ before. It has the 110 f2.8, which everybody loves, 2.8 aperture, uh, six by seven. Even though depth of field will play you some bad, <laughs> bad results sometimes. But yeah, it's a really, really great system. You can also mount the RB lenses on the RZ, which gives you that mechanical shutter in the lens. So, you know, you don't have any issue. It has like a special dial for the RB, but you do have to be very careful. The RB67 lenses need to be CLA'd because if they are not, that tension of the mechanical RB of like cocking the, the shutter on the lens will strip the gears on the RZ. And we've seen a few of those at Camera Rescue. So do be very weird, like you have to test that the RB lens is kind of smooth when you want to use it on the RZ. But yeah, the RZ is just the camera of the internet. I think that and the Mamiya 7 have been like the winners overall for a few years. And they made two models, so that always adds up results. Yes, and then what you said about, about checking if it's working properly, that for, for both Mamiya, the RB and the RZ 67, and for all medium format cameras, the vast majority, and for the Mamiya's, it's basically 99% of cameras that we see here at camerastore.com do require service. So if you're buying one of these cameras and investing a significant amount of money into it, 
it's worth doing it from somebody that's tested, cleaned, checked, and fixed it if necessary, because running a roll through it does not mean you know that it works. Yeah, it, it's peace of mind. At the end of the day, you want to get the best results you can, or at least results, <laughs> probably. Yeah. And also for decades, like it will like a properly, you know, well lubricated and it will last around a decade, which you probably should check it before, but yeah. you know, don't be scared of, you know, pay that extra money for the mm -hmm. peace of mind. But yeah, yeah, what do we have in, oh, number four we don't have. Number four is, is our first um, MIA camera. It's the Mumia 7 that we just referenced here. So we have the Mumia 6 that we can use as a, as a stand-in and I'll extend it so that it looks more like a 7. <laughs> so the Mumia 7, not the 6, is a uh, six by seven rangefinder camera. So the same format as these huge SLRs, but in a rangefinder style. Um, obviously there's pros and cons to this. Um, you're not looking directly through the lens. You don't have interchangeable backs, so you have to reload the camera after every roll. Um, but there are considerable advantages too, mainly that this fits in my hands and won't hurt your back if you carry it all day. Um, the Lumia 7 is one of the most popular medium format cameras out there. Yeah. A super niche product um, designed for a super niche use case, but being able to carry around a 6x7 camera that can fit in a, in a bag is super helpful and yeah. very, really, really nice. Yeah, the Mamiya 7, I think, was made in a way not so much for editorial work like magazines, which were the RZ and the RB, but more for like the press kind of like slow press which uh, slow journalism i know that still today a lot of press photographers that go to certain areas of the world doing you know their daily newspaper work carry a mamiya 7 still in their bag and they do that slow process of shooting film and documenting things in a different style it really is a very compact camera it doesn't fold like the six like it doesn't like uh, collapse into itself but it is quite small. The lenses are not so luminous, uh, like they're, they're not f2.8s, they're f4s, f4.5s, but it does have, from super wide angle, it has a 43 uh, Biogon style lens that is extremely good, uh, all the way to a 210 that's uncoupled, but you know, it's made for like aerial photography. So you have quite a lot of lenses. You can exchange lenses while the camera's loaded. It has an internal like light baffle yeah. system that's very useful. Um, and basically they made a great camera. They are sort of plasticky in the feel and the touch, but they are very, very, very good. Plus the glass is extremely sharp and everybody likes that six by seven look. I feel like one thing we haven't mentioned in, in this series of video uh, is that the medium format look separates you from 35. And the reason 645 is usually not so loved is it kind of has the same, you know, two to three aspect ratio. So that six, seven is more like that four by five, eight by 10 large format feel. So people like it. And the seven is so sharp that I know a lot of people have put down their four by fives to pick up a Mamiya seven and haven't regretted it. So, and it's portable. Like you said, you can take it, has aperture priority, which makes shooting really fast if you're in a, you know, a rush. Uh, I think it's, it's easily also one of the, big, the favorite six by seven if you don't want an SLR basically. Yeah, I, I mean, I've, I've shot two rolls with a Mamiya 7, and even comparing it to the, the Plobo Machina, which is another super popular, well-regarded 6x7 camera, using this is, is much easier. You have a pretty standard control layout with you know a lens-based focus ring, which is one of the main issues with the Plobo, is that the focus is up here. Um, it, it just feels good. It just works the way that you'd expect it to. Yeah. And they made, they made the multiple Mamiya 7, so you had the, the, the Mamiya 7 and 7.2, so you also have a bit more search results in that. But yeah, it's very popular. You just have to watch YouTube a few times to see that people love the Mamiya 7. Yes. It's very, very sought out. It also, price point has gone up tremendously due to the demand, um, and there's not that much supply. And it was sold new till around five, seven years ago probably i might be dating myself and remembering exactly but i remember seeing them new uh they were not that expensive new i they were new old stock in ebay for like two thousand dollars which was a deal nowadays but you know they have been around for a while and they're really really good yeah released in 1995 yeah. so so i guess they had like a 10 year 
maybe 10, 15 year. Yeah, sales. but but again, sort of one of those medium format cameras and cameras in general released right at the end of the film. professional film era. Yeah. Um, so not that many made, and again, made for a pretty specific photographer. Yeah. Um, so that's contributing to their massive price increase. Yeah. And then we go to number five. Yeah, number five is the, I'll just leave this here. Number five is another modular SLR, but much smaller, if you look at the two next to each other. Much, much, much smaller. smaller. So this is the Hasselblad 500CM, uh, released in the 1960s. This is sort of the, uh, not necessarily the granddaddy of modular SLRs, but probably the oldest and most popular, like, configuration. Um, it is considerably smaller than the RB and RZ. It loses a, a centimeter in either direction. It's six by six square format. But I think the advantage of having it be so much smaller is quite a big advantage. And of course, the Carl Zeiss lenses are a big advantage as well. Leaf shutters, so they sink at any speed. Um, second to none build quality. Really, there's just, you know, not much better than, than I mean, Hasselblad. yeah, I think like Hasselblad did one thing right is that they made a camera that didn't really change in any of the modularity throughout decades. Uh, we're talking about same design from early 50s or even earlier because the 500C maybe was a little earlier than that. And the lens mount, the viewfinder mount, the back mount is all modular. You can change from 645 to 6x6 six six to 120 to 220 film, uh, rest in peace to 20 film. Um, you had like even some 35 backs. They have interchangeable uh, focusing screens, which is a really good feature if you're like an architecture photographer and you need frame lines and you know you want to keep things straight. They had uh, a ton of lenses. The lineup goes from like uh, fish eye all the way to uh, I think 500 or 1000. I'm not sure if there's even a thousand. I know the 500 exists for sure. Um, sometimes they would release lenses that would never would have released uh, because of low demand or high price. But yeah, they're so, so good. And the 500 CM is probably the one that stayed around the longest. And it's fully mechanical, which means it can be repaired. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of Hasselblad technicians still left, thankfully. Uh, quite a lot of bodies to use as spares if there's no spares left. And yeah, it gives you that six by six, which used to be advertised as letting you crop whatever way you wanted because people wanted to crop around a six, four, five for the magazines or six, seven ish format. So they would be like, don't choose orientation one way or the other, just shoot square and you know, crop after, which nowadays everybody loves the square as a square, but that was the target back in the day. So yeah, I think Hasselblad has a very big name and the 500CM is obviously probably top no, you know, It's the top of the searches on the Hasselblad. Yeah, and I mean, you really are getting the resolution that you need to crop with the 6x6 and with these Carl Zeiss lenses. Yeah. It really, you know, that's as much image quality as almost anybody needs. Um, it's great for Instagram. Yeah, well, square, square format. Yep, that's how it started. And I think maybe one of the most satisfying sounds of yeah. any camera. Moving further down the list, we're back in 6x7 land with the Pentax 6.7. We have a 6.7.2 here to show you. This is a basically an SLR on steroids. And that's basically these are non-modular SLRs. So you can think about an Icon F, you can think about any of the cameras from our top 10 35 millimeter SLRs, just bigger. And that's more or less how the 6.7 works. Um, yeah, this is the, the 6.7.2, which comes with pretty advanced metering capabilities, um, interchangeable prisms, focusing screens as well. Um, a, a large suite of lenses yeah, very um, large. That, that cover, again, from fisheye to super telephoto. Yeah, they made really big telephotos. I think the Pentax 6x7, is a camera that if you're used to that uh, like language of 35 SLR and you're like, oh, I want to go medium format, it just, you don't need anything to just pick it up and start shooting without having to read a manual or anything like the Hasselblads, the Mamiyas are a little bit more like, oh, wait, wait, I focus with this wheel, there's bellows or uh, the Hasselblad has the interchangeable backs and like the advance is different, but like this just holds in your hand like a beefy 35 
they made three models. So you have the 6.7, 6.7, uh, well, 6x7, 6x7 MLU, I guess four models, uh, 6.7 and then 6.72, which made them, you know, a lot of cameras that be out, a lot of lenses. The advantage is basically that you can see what you're shooting. You can focus through the screen at your eyes. So if you're actually shooting like portraiture, you don't need those huge prism finders that you have on the uh, other, like these other uh, SLRs. So yeah, I think it's amazing. I And then it has the 105 to f2.4, which everybody once again loves shooting wide open. Also depth of field will play sometimes against you. Yes. Yeah, it's a really, really nice camera. Um, I think, you know, Pentax, when they made this camera, just really, you know, mark that like chunky, big camera, easy to use, professional. Also, lenses are not uh, leaf shutters. There's only two lenses are leaf shutters in the lineup. There's the 90 LS and the 165 LS. So if you want to shoot studio, you're limited with 130th max uh, shutter speed sync. But if you know your studio, you can control light and you can shoot no problem only outdoors so you have a bit more limitations but yeah it's a great camera and i think people that want the mamiya 7 will look at the pentax because of the 105 f 2.4 and because they're usually more affordable yeah yeah if you want that ultra shallow depth of field i mean like 2.4 f 2.4 doesn't necessarily sound so fast if you're used to 35 millimeter with f 1.4 lenses and f 1 lenses but on such a large format as 6.7, 2.4 gives you razor thin depth of field. And that's why you were saying that, you know, you can miss focus easily yeah. with 2.4. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that the, this standard SLR format is easier for most people coming from 35. I think that, yes, the prisms on modular SLRs like the Hasselblad and RZ, RB are, can be really bulky. Yeah, and heavy. And this is a heavy camera, but as it's only the camera that you need, and it does have a waist level finder, but it's kind of annoying if you want to shoot vertical because waist level finder of verticals uh, is basically a nightmare, but it's very easy. And this one has the built-in grip. The other ones had the wooden grip that were like on the left hand, which I don't mind for carrying, but is not so comfortable. But yeah, it doesn't have a hot shoe on uh, these cameras, so that can be a slightly annoying if you want to use flash and sync, but you know, that's, basically the only disadvantage does have pc ports. yeah they have so the on. sync ports here and and the the grip the accessory grip does have a cold shoe on it yeah. so that's sort of i think the intention yeah uh but you know the flash sync being at 1 30th it's, it's maybe not the camera designed for studio flash use especially when it was competing with these which suit that so much better with their leaf shutter lenses oh and one thing i think is pretty important is it has a max shutter speed of 1 1000 which these all these have 400 uh, has of us have 500 uh, so that is a full stop more so you can shoot more wide open in daylight with like portrait 400 or something like that yeah. which is also kind of nice you can freeze a bit more yeah yeah super helpful for especially for portraiture yeah, yeah. a great option and um the only standard slr on the list yeah so standard looking <laughs> yeah yeah so next we have uh, another Hasselblad. It's the 500C, the, the predecessor to the CM. And um, yeah, they, they basically accomplished the same things as the CM. It's just a, a slightly older model. Um, the accessories and lenses and backs will work interchangeably between them. Um, we just have a, a body here to show you. So yeah. yeah. The C is probably popular because first of all, as it came earlier, it is cheaper. And then it doesn't have the interchangeable focusing screen. Some uh, C's might have it. There was like what I call bridge models, which is when they started implementing some changes towards the newer model. Yeah. But the C just is usually cheaper for that fact. People don't like that they can't change uh, the uh, focusing screen themselves. You can change them. You just need a like, technician to do it and calibrate. And they're very important to calibrate properly with the tools that are needed, because if not, they just won't focus properly. Uh, at infinity, especially your close-ups and so on. So yeah, this is probably on the list for being the cheaper alternative to the 500 CM, uh, made a little older, but just as good uh, mechanically. I feel like the, the ELMs one day will pick up, mostly because they're really affordable, the motor ones that had the motor on the back, 
but because of that big motor, they're not so portable when you're outside. So yeah, great camera. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes, to reiterate what you said about the focusing screens, it really is essential that if you can't, on this model, you can't change them yourself. And if you try and misalign them, your shots will not come out in focus <laughs> uh, because things are not aligned. But also, I, I was thinking that there's probably a, quite a few of these that do have interchangeable screens because it's, it's one of those things that they probably offered a service for people who bought the 500C to upgrade. Maybe. And they changed parts. So that was a, a pretty common thing that Hasselblad did. And Nikon, Leica, you know, you see sort of... Frankenstein yeah, models. Where, where they release an update and incorporate new features and people who bought the previous one are like, I want that. Yeah. So... Yeah, and that was a thing back in the day. It wasn't just like, you know, get rid of your previous camera, get a new one. Yeah. It was just like, hey, we can upgrade your old one because it's still possible. Yeah. Yeah. Then we have the Mamiya 6. So um, we talked about the Mamiya 7 earlier, a 6x7 rangefinder. This is the 6, the slightly older model. This released in 1989. Uh, and this is a 6x6 rangefinder camera. So a square format rangefinder camera that is collapsible. Uh, the lens sort of goes back into the body there, but still with interchangeable lenses. It has three interchangeable lenses, uh, a 75 normal, um, a wide angle, and then a telephoto. So you are able to basically do general photography with this set of lenses. Um, uh, same uh, leaf shutters as the Mamiya 7. Um, overall, more or less the same. No aperture priority on this model. Um, yeah. yeah, it's it's a great. Le I mean, if you're picking a rangefinder and you want uh, something small, then you got to kind of pick what format you want: six four five, six 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 seven, six eight six nine. And by six six, like this is just such a small model; it fits anywhere. The lack of availability of lenses, like the choice, is really good because you got fifty, seventy five, one fifty. So you don't kind of go dabble like, oh, which one do I get on the Mamiya 7? It can be confusing. Do I want the 65? Do I want the 50? Do I want the 43? This one has three. You can pretty much own them all without breaking the bank. They're still pretty affordable nowadays because the 7 is more searched for. But yeah, the 6 is really nice. It fits in your pocket. It just has that meter that's pretty useful when you're shooting out and about and just the compact design and leaf shutter so you can sync with flash if you want to do flash photography. You can change the uh, lenses with the film loaded because it also has that little in internal baffle or you know dark slide in the camera. So yeah, it's overall a great camera. And if you do want sharpness, like Mamiya glass just is undeniably probably the best out yeah. there. Yeah, some shockingly sharp lenses. Like for some things almost too sharp. <laughs> and that's, you know, it's subjective what you think is a good lens. But if you want sharpness, these Mamiya lenses will not disappoint. Yeah. Um, for landscapes, for people who do intricate details and patterns, that's, these are great choices. One thing to mention, I don't know if we mentioned, is both Mamiya 6 and 7 are electronic. So if something goes wrong, uh, you know, mechanically, they can be fixed. But electronically, it's a little bit more complicated. So be wary of that choice. It'll often require replacement parts which can be difficult to find for cameras this expensive. Um, can't be found new from Mumia, so be, be careful if you buy one, uh, and be careful if you own one. Yeah. Treat them nicely. Yeah, so the next one on our list is one that we also don't have. It is the Yashikamat 124G. Uh, it's the, the final model of the Yashikamat series, um, released in 1970 and sold for quite a while, I think over a decade. Um, it is a TLR, much like this Rolly, and it would be easy to say that it's a Rolly Flex copy, but Yashica really, you know, had their own thing that they were doing, especially with uh, CDS light meters that Rolly didn't get into as much. They had quite a few selenium cells, but the, yeah, Yashica models were aimed at a more general market, so they're at a lower price point with lower build quality and f3.5 lenses. Um, the Mat 20, Mat 124G is probably the most popular model. Yeah, I mean, Yashica made a lot of uh, TLRs. They have all basically all the letters, the A, B, C, D. I don't know how many they made. And then you have the Mat Mat 124 and then Mat 124G. 
that G kind of like, as you said, was the last model, looks more modern. Uh, it is uh, slightly on the use, a little nicer if you're used to like a more modern camera. And also there's so many out there that they've been very affordable throughout the years. And they're still the higher uh, price one of all the Yashica TLRs. So don't sleep on any other models because they're just as good probably, or you know, very close yeah. by. And if they've been serviced, they will work very, very well. Mm -hmm. If you do want a light meter, it is probably, I think, the only one that has a light meter. And it's a useful convenience to have a light meter and a TLR. Yeah. It just shoots nicely. If you really want a TLR and you don't want to break the bank, it is the you know lightest weight uh, option, maybe with Rolly cord and weight. But like, you know, it really is small and affordable mm -hmm. compared to Rolly Flex. And if then you have affordable with the Mamiya C line, but those are really heavy because yeah. of what we're going to speak in a moment. Yeah, yeah. The, um, so the, the earlier Yashica TLRs, um, were quite a lot lighter than the Yashica mats. Uh, didn't have light meters, as you said. The, one of the main advantages of the Yashica mat is one of the same advantages of the Rolly Flex over the cord, and it's that this advanced lever also cocks the shutter. Um, the older Yashica TLRs uh, have separate advance and shutter cocking mechanisms, so it's just an extra step. But yeah, you don't have to worry about that with the uh, Yashica Mat 124G. So it's a great choice if you're looking to get into medium format. I think that those non role TLRs are, are just going to continue to become more popular as people want to get into medium format and don't want to spend thousands. So yeah, it's, it's, it's nice to see it on the top 10. Honestly, um, they are a very nice option for TLRs. And then we go to what's the next? So the next one is this, the the Rolly 2.8, uh, originally released in 1949 and then iterated upon until, I believe, the 1980s? Probably even later. I think the GX or FX, I'm not sure about which one is. It basically was sold new till like a few years ago when Rolly Flex went bankrupt. Yeah. They sold the parts to some people and there's still some being like refurbished and looking brand, pretty brand new. And they made all those limited edition ones with like the cockadrat like you know all those weird leatherettes and gold uh, accents and so on but yeah i think the 2.8 is one of those cameras that like it is a 2.8 lens they have the 2.8 and 3.5 on the roll effects lineup 2.8 is just more you know more light more separation uh depending on the conditions you're shooting you might need it they're not much bigger it is a little heavier on the front because yeah. of course there's more glass but they're just really, really nice. Mm -hmm. And the, there's so many 2.8 models, that's probably one of the reasons that it also scales up. There's 2.8E, we have an E3 here, 2.8F, there's a 2.8D, 2.8D, uh, C, sorry. There's so many. So it's, I mean, we're talking about almost 60 years probably of continuous production, tons of models, really nice. Like also there's that whole like uh, taking street photography or photography without having to put the camera to your face. They're friendlier when you're shooting. People don't think you have something and you're like, you know, stealing something. It kind of looks like a cute camera. Anytime you take a camera like this out, people stop you and ask you, oh, is that an old camera? What are you doing? So it is very friendly to shoot out and about. People usually do accept portraits of strangers and things like that. So I think it makes it a very nice contender. Plus, Rolly Flex. I mean, the name itself is uh, standard for quality. So it's a good choice. And I'm happy to see it on the list, too, because, you know, Hasselblad and all these are good, but TLRs are very nice, too. Yeah. And, and these 2.8 models generally come with either Carl Zeiss or Schneider Kruznach lenses, um, either Planar or... or Sonar designs, or are they Tessar designs? Sonar. Sonar, Planar. Yeah, Sonar and Planar are usually the fight. Yeah. Well, that, that's the Schneider ones. The Schneider ones are, are, are Xenar and Zenitar. And then there's Planar and another Zeiss design that I'm forgetting. And our technician, Tony, will Killer. be upset with me for this. Uh, he's told me many times that I forgot. So, but, but yeah, the, the Schneider Kuznock ones, everybody talks about the Zeiss lenses as being, you know, top quality. But the, the Schneider ones really are impressive in their own way. And they're kind of, you know, paying homage to the Zeiss designs, but they're really, really excellent lenses. And if you can find one, this is a, a, a planar design. But yeah, those Schneider lenses are really, really excellent. There's fans for both sides, I feel. People, some people like the rendering of one, some people like the sharpness of the other. So like, it's more like a pick and choose. 
honestly if you can find a 2.8 i would recommend just picking it up trying to use it do get it if you can overhauled or by overhauled already uh, because they are aged uh, the focusing screens sometimes are very dim the focusing system can be like uh, mucky and a little bit you know the the grease is old because we we're saying they're over 60 uh, years old some models so yeah you want to take care of that but it's a really really nice camera very compact uh, very classic look i mean if you think about medium format cameras and you put a, like an icon of a rolleiflex everybody's going to know what it is yeah. That, that classic TLR silhouette, uh, it's, it's a Rolleiflex. Yeah. And every other, almost every other TLR that came out is called a Rolleiflex copy. Yes. Because they sort of just nailed the design almost right away. Yeah, um, yeah they're, they're, just, they're just great. <laughs> they're really good. So the, the final entry on our list, number 10, is another TLR that we don't have. Um, it is the Mamiya C330, which again is a, a twin lens reflex camera with a, a take, different taking and viewing lens. I think the main advantage of the C system is that it has interchangeable lenses, which is pretty unique and, and creative for a TLR system. So there are two lenses basically attached that you can swap the whole um, group. Yeah, the group. You can swap both of them out um, for telephoto, for wide angle. Um, this makes the camera so much more flexible than a, a standard TLR. That's one of the big, um, it, not issues, but limitations of the TLR is that it has just the lens that it has. Yeah. Um, and to get a wide angle, you need a wide role, which is, and they or made, an adapter. And they made some adapters, like a clip-on sort of things for the Yashica and the Rolleiflex, yeah. but like the Mamiya C330 has that option to change lenses their leaf shutters so they sync at all speeds just like the Rolleiflex and the Yashica mm -hmm. but they also have bellows yes. which is something yeah. in TLRs you don't see that often yeah, just and like, just like the RB yes. it's Mamiya again bringing the same system and if you're wondering why do you need bellows on a camera basically the limitation of focus usually is uh, with the helical of a lens and on a Rolleiflex for example how far it can go and it usually goes around to like a meter uh, something like that, maybe sometimes a little bit less if you're using like a tele uh, Rolleiflex. But when you're using bellows, you can go up close to like 30 centimeters, 50 centimeters and do some weird stuff. It's really fun. There's one disadvantage is it's, you're not viewing what you're taking. So there's the viewing lens and the taking lens that one is on top of the other. Yeah. That creates a problem with parallax. Mm -hmm. So for example, the latest model, the, the one that's on the list, number 10, the C330, had like a little line that would move through the focusing screen to show you what would be the top of your frame and you kind of had to imagine the bottom of the frame. So it's very flexible, it lets you change lenses with a roll inside, has like a, another like, like dark slide kind of a gizmo inside which lets you do that. It's really nice. It does come at the cost of weight yeah. with all those features because you're including bellows, you're including the whole like light baffle so you can change lenses but it has interchangeable focusing screens by the user, prisms, and like a waist level finder. It's amazing. And there's many of the Mamiya C line. With number 10 is the th uh, C330, which had multiple models, but you have the C3, uh, uh, C220, and then the C3, and the C. So you have plenty of these models. So just don't worry about that at all. Just uh, enjoy. Um, using a TLR that has all those bells and whistles, if that's the thing you like. Yeah, it, it's funny to talk about the Mamiya cameras, I think, because they, they really occupy the two extremes of weight and size, and that the, the RB and RZ are the biggest, bulkiest ones that you can think of, and then they have cameras like the C330, which is also one of the biggest TLRs made because yeah. they put extra features in. But then you also have the 6 and 7, which were clearly designed you know, I bet they got a few letters in the mail saying, why are your cameras so heavy? And they said, fine, we'll make the lightest one we can. Yeah, and I've, and I've read a lot of times when the people talk about the uh, rangefinders, like, why didn't they put a 2.8 lens? And uh, Plowboat made a 2.8 lens on their rangefinder. And honestly, when you're shooting rangefinder, like Connor said, there's limitations with the fact that you're not seeing what you're focusing and like the parallax, I mean, uh, the rangefinder separation. So you want to be careful. So you don't want to be shooting like, a portrait at one meter with a 2.8 lens on a rangefinder six by seven because you probably are gonna miss focus and I own a plow bill I can assess that that happens uh, it's very finicky so yeah I, I think they did do that uh, to me 
Mamiya was the brand that was like, offer everything people want. Like just like make the features that everybody wants, however, what the cost of the size of the camera or the features, just put it all in there. And they didn't stand back. Like Hasselblad stood back keeping that traditional design, making it small and everything was extra gizmos you would add on to try to get more like bellows or extension tubes. But if you ever shot like portraits with extension tubes on the Hasselblad, you know that if you don't mount them correctly, they jam. If you don't take them off correctly, they jam. Like it's a, it's a pain and then calculating exposure. The Mamiya's just had the graph on the side. So to me, like it, it's super cool they made that. And the C330 is basically all that in a TLR. Yeah. It has the scales, has a little bar that you can change what lens you're using, yeah. which gives you the different scale. And it's like a hexagon or something like that. And it has like all the different, it's amazing. It's an amazing camera. And yes, if you want a TLR and you want something classic, you go for a Rolly, but if you're one of those that's like, ooh, I like the features, or you can't choose lenses every time you go out, just pick a Mamiya C330, uh, C220, and you'll be very, very happy. So it's nice to see it on the list because it's such a feature-full camera. Yeah. It's, it's for the, the photographer who needs a TLR and who can't compromise on anything else. Exactly. Except weight. <laughs> Except, yeah, you've got a good strap and, and so on. Also, they're usually quite affordable. Still, compared to the Rolleiflex counterpart, uh, maybe up there with the uh, Yashica Matte because you know Yashica is also on the entry, uh, you know, entry level compared to mm -hmm. Rolleiflex. So you've got to pick. Like, do I want one lens for everything and limit myself, which is a creative uh, choice, or do I want to have six lenses in my bag that weigh, you know, two kilos and choose if I want to shoot a 180 millimeter on my TLR, which is another choice. Yeah, and then their choice is, you know, that's. There are many different kinds of photographers out there, and we're lucky that there are so many different kinds of even TLRs out there, yeah. and SLRs, and medium format cameras in general, and that's that's what we're here doing, is celebrating the most popular the ones. choices. Yeah, the best choices, and the wide variety of choices. But yeah, this is a top 10, uh, basically, yeah. which is a very interesting list, for sure. Yeah, and I, I think that um, in medium format especially, you get that extra flexibility that comes from these the TLRs and from modular SLRs that really you can pick what shooting style works for you and find a camera that really fits it and can be customized to fit it even better. Yeah. Whereas with 35 millimeter, your options are maybe a little bit more limited. You kind of have to adjust to an SLR or a rangefinder, especially if you're not used to it. But in medium format, which is good because they're so expensive that you don't want to buy a bunch of them, um, you can find one that really fits you. Yeah. Yeah, that just about covers the top 10 medium format cameras of 2022. Again, based on search results and ads from 2021. So predicting the future a bit. Yeah, let us know if there's something that you're like, oh, wow, why is that on the list? Or wait, why is that not on the list? Because it's not a list that we make up ourselves mm -hmm. by like our favorite because they're not, it will just all be uh, Mamiya's in my uh, list. <laughs> but if uh, you think something's missing, let us know. It's always fun to read what people like and enjoy and search and, you know, maybe think is unfair. Yeah, leave a comment below if, if our list is not your list. Um, otherwise, I've been Connor from Camera Store, joined again by Nico from Camera Rescue. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye.